Our evolutionary ancestors once possessed the ability to intuit what food their bodies needed, in what proportions, and ate the right things in the proper amounts. Perfect nutritional harmony. From wild baboons to gooey slime molds, most living organisms instinctually know how to balance their diets, except modern day humans. When and why did we lose this ability and how can we get it back? That is what we are going to answer for you today. My guests today are the authors of this fabulous book called Eat Like the Animals. David Robenheimer is the Leonard P. Allman Professor of Nutritional Ecology in the School of Life and Environmental Sciences and Nutrition Theme Leader in the Charles Perkins Center at the University of Sydney. Stephen J. Simpson is Academic Director of the Charles Perkins Center and Professor in the School of Life and Environmental Sciences at the University of Sydney. So welcome, gentlemen, to the podcast. Thanks, Karen. Yay, I'm so happy to have you here. I am very rarely have I done the threesome podcast. <laughs> so it's always a new, it's a new thing for me. I think I've only ever done one other one. So there you go. You guys are one of the few. So <laughs> two of you, the few. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so th- it's super interesting that you guys even wrote this book because this is not you're like human nutrition is not your expertise or was not in, up until now. So tell us a little bit about what brought you to this book and what, like, who are you guys? What do you do? Well, Dave, do you want to go first? Would you like to? Like yeah, to- so um, we're kind of comparative biologists who say humans aren't our species. And in a sense, no specific species is our species because we study a lot of them. And of course, humans are just another species. We have many things in common and some things that are different with the other species that we study. And what we've done for the past 35, going on 40 years now, is step back and look at the broad range of species that are out there in the natural world, and then place our own species in the context of those. So we can see get a clear view of what's similar among all the other species, what we expect to find in our own species, look for that, what differs in our species and other species, and look for that. And that's the way we've moved ahead with our um, work on human nutrition. We found similarities and differences, um, and that's helped us to understand not only humans, but also other species. And in the book, I, I do have to say, like, you guys, the way you've written the book really makes a person not want to put it down like there's excitement to it with all your stories and you guys have had a crazy life like Stephen let's just talk about a little bit about where you've been in this world both of you we've had harsh jungle terrain <laughs> like really harsh jungle Amazon terrain deserts there was one place I can never remember the name of it that was way up in the mountains somewhere where was that Bhutan Bhutan I was like trying to tell my sister, yes, I'm like, Buta, Buta. she's like, Budapest. I'm like, no, 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 that wasn't it. <laughs> so Bhutan, there was, um, was it in Tibet as well? Um, yes, I've been to Tibet, but that wasn't in Tibet. That was, um, I also work in Nepal, which is on the um, southern border um, of Tibet. Mm-hmm. So I think it's great that you guys have been able to, you weren't just studying human nutrition in Australia and our North American type ways, you were all over the world looking at nutrition in both humans as well as animals. So I want to start, maybe um, Stephen, you could just tell the story that you guys start off with in the book because it really gives a good baseline, which is the story of Stella. Mm. Well, Stella, uh, we, we, we sort of set it up that such that the reader introduces themselves to the idea of um, the complexity of nutrition. So Stella is um, followed by a PhD student in South Africa for 30 days, day after day, recording all the things that she eats and selected from her food environment. And that included pretty close to 90 different foods, some whole foods, some of them processed foods, and she was eating on different days, different combinations of foods, and it looked incredibly complicated. 
But when you distilled it down to the amount of protein she was eating and the amount of non-protein energy, fats and carbs she was eating, it turned out she was tracking this precise ratio of the two. She was like a nutrient-seeking missile, sort of traveling through this complicated food environment um, and really sticking very closely to this single ratio of protein to non-protein energy. And we, we sort of set it up there to say, well, how on earth did she do that? Did she have a degree in dietetics? Did she have <laughs> computer programs that could help her to do it? Um, well, and the answer was none of those things because um, as we reveal, Stella was a baboon. Um, and that was really a, a device for us to begin our story, our, our story about how wild animals, even in changed food environments, still seem to be able to get it right. Um, and then we moved on to talk about something at the other extreme of the um, animal kingdom or even beyond the animal kingdom, the slime mold, which <laughs> doesn't even, it has no brain, it has, it's a single cell with lots of nuclei, it's like the blob out of B movie fame, and it too could balance its diet precisely, and, and that's extraordinary, it doesn't even have arms and legs or a mouth and it can still do it. Yeah. And so that set up the question, if they can do it, why can't we? Yeah. And how do they do it? That's yeah. a really important question. Yeah. And do we share the same mechanisms that enable them to, to do that? Yeah. And you guys went on to really test this on multiple different species. One of them was a locust, which mm. I thought was very interesting about what, what they did when their protein was low. <laughs> yes, so, so locusts, you might say, well, why locusts? And it turns out, mm -hmm. that, as, you, as you pointed out, Karen, we're neither of us um, traditional human nutritionists. We didn't begin with a degree in dietetics. We began, um, in both our cases, doing PhDs on the feeding behavior of locusts. And locusts are mass warming grasshoppers that cause devastation across the planet. We all, we've all seen them on telly, you know, huge numbers swarming through, eating everything in their path. And we, we chose them as an animal to try and really explore whether they have the capability of what we might call nutritional wisdom. Do they just eat everything um, or are they actually more precise in their food choices? Turns out, of course, they are. They're really remarkably clever at eating the right balance of nutrients, not eating too much, not eating too little. And we wanted to explore how that works and, and what the consequences are if you put the animal in, in, in a suboptimal nutritional environment. You force it not to be able to choose the right foods, but to have to make compromises about its diet by putting it in um, an imbalanced nutritional environment. And what we found was that locusts will um, prioritize their intake of protein over other nutrients. They have the innate capability to balance their intake of carbohydrate and protein and, and other nutrients, a small number of other nutrients, and that'll help them balance their diet in the right food environment. But if you put them in a confined environment, they'll prioritize protein. And that means they'll overeat um, energy to get enough protein if they're in a protein dilute world, or they'll eat less energy in a protein concentrated world and end up losing weight as a result of that. But we also found that when they have an appetite for protein, when they're craving protein, which they do, then they will meet that craving in, in a rather unpleasant way um, through cannibalism. And uh, we did some extraordinary experiments demonstrating how cannibalism is one of the, the driving forces that leads to locusts and other um, animals like them to forming these mass migrating um, vast swarms that can cause real problems. Um, and we talk in the book about going to Utah and looking at Mormon crickets, which are another of these vast um, swarming flightless crickets that look like little 
tanks and are, um, are really quite adept at eating one another. They're, they're cannibals of the first order. But really just shows that the drive for protein. Right. That's, that, that's crazy that they'll eat each other to, to get to meet that quota that they need inside. Like they just have this intuitive need for protein. Exactly. That's just, that's just crazy. So maybe David, you could tell us like out of all you, you guys went and you, you were looking at domesticated animals. You looked at every type of animal in the animal. You were looking at lions and what, what came out of all of that? What was the number well, one thing that these all these animals were going for? The number one thing was going for a balanced diet. That's what came out of it. As we, um, as Steve described about Stella the baboon, is what animals do and they can do, both in our laboratory experiments and in the wild, is that they mix a diet to achieve a particular balance of nutrients in that diet. That is the common factor that we've observed in all of the species that we've studied across all of the contexts that we've worked, both laboratory, um, invertebrate animals, right up to um, chimpanzees, orangutans, and gorillas in the wild. It's the same thing. Target a balanced diet, mix foods to obtain that when they can. But Ecology is complex. It's very changeable. There are seasons. There are um, random factors in where animals happen to forage in a particular day. All sorts of things can throw them off the ability to achieve that balanced diet on a given day. For example, a foraging orangutan um, in some periods might not have access to the fruits that it needs to get fats and carbohydrates. So in that case, it's um, immersed through natural patterns in what Steve referred to as an imbalanced environment. What we found in many of the species when they are in an imbalanced environment in that way, not all of the species we've studied, but many, we find that they prioritize protein. So that the way that they mix their foods into a balanced diet is using separate appetites for separate nutrients. And those appetites interact in a balanced environment to enable them to mix the diet, the balanced diet. But when they're in the imbalanced in diet, those uh, um, environment, those appetites come to compete with each other. And we found very commonly the strongest of appetites is protein. So that if the animal is in an environment where fruits aren't available and it has to eat, it's forced to eat high protein leaves. It eats a certain amount of protein, fats and carbohydrates. If it is in an environment where fruits are available, that it has access to fats and carbohydrates as well, it eats the same amount of protein, but it eats more fats and carbohydrates in order to achieve that same amount of protein. So the common factors are separate appetites for separate nutrients. Where they can, they're very good at balancing their diet. Most animals where they can't, they eat to a fixed amount of protein. And fats and carbohydrate intake and energy intake fluctuate, therefore, passively with the balance of fats to carbohydrates in the food environment that they're in. And humans are the same as that. Yeah, because you guys then, after all this animal experiment, you decided, does this apply to humans? The million dollar question. And like you say in the book, it's really challenging to study humans <laughs> with this, right? Because you guys, you guys did come up with it, but in, in most cases, it's very, very challenging, especially because you can't even, you know, for to study a human through its whole life, well... You know, you'd have to, that would take a very long time, but you guys figured it out. You did put these, you put a group of people and I won't get into the details because we need people to read the book, but you did, you were able to apply this to humans in a controlled environment and you did find the same thing. And so I want to be really clear for the listeners, what they're saying here and what they, what David just said, which was animals including humans are always seeking out a, a certain amount of protein so and did that differ from animal to humans as far as how much protein we're seeking uh, yes it does so so depending on the natural food of um, an animal and and 
how it's evolved in its natural food environment. Different animals have different target levels, as we call them, of protein. So the proportion of protein in a balanced diet will depend on the animal. Um, and, and so you'll see at one extreme, for example, if you look at the green flies that suck the sap out of plants, they, they have a minuscule protein target because their natural food is nearly all sugar. It's very, very dilute in protein. Uh, and on the other extreme, if you're a cat, uh, um, an obligate carnivore that eats other animals, uh, you have a 60%, 50 or 60% protein target. So it depends on the animal, but of course it also depends on other factors such as the time of life. Um, and you see that in humans as well as, as we go throughout our lives, our optimal diet balance shifts. It shifts to reflect growth, development, reproduction, aging, and all the other things that we do in our lives. And it's also impacted, of course, by um, whether you're challenged with infections, whether you're highly physically active, uh, and so on and so forth. And so in general, Stephen, what is the human, what did you guys discover about human beings? What percentage of our diet are we seeking for, to eat in protein? Well, if you, look, if you look across human populations across the planet, there is no human population that has food sufficiency um, that's ever been recorded with lower than a 10% protein diet. And there's none been recorded with higher than around 25 to 30% protein. And very, very typically, when you look um, at population after population, the number of around 15% keeps coming up time and time again. And it changes. So if you look at the composition of breast milk, for example, that's only about 7% protein, and that's a, an optimal diet if you're an infant. But as you go throughout life, the percent protein goes typically up to about 15%, um, up to 20 during pregnancy and, and, and sort of the period of life when you're growing and developing quick, um, rapidly or developing an embryo in the case of pregnancy. But then when you get older, um, midlife, it goes back down again to about 15%, and then it comes back up again um, around your late 50s, 60s, and particularly we think around the period of menopause in women, it goes up again. So the protein target, you can imagine tracing it throughout your life course, shifting in the balance, the optimal balance of protein to non-protein energy, according to the, the time course of your existence and, and, your, and, and the challenges that the environment places upon you. And so, so in our experiments yeah. with, with adults, with adults Jama adult Jamaicans, um, with Professor Terence Forrester, what we found was that um, they selected a diet of 15% protein. And it's not only in experiments, but we're doing analyses of diet survey data now and finding that there's a very strong tendency as well in those data in for people um, outside of an experiment or sitting in their everyday lives to select a diet that's around 15 to 20 percent um, of protein. So it's a very strong signal. Yeah, and that's that's so exact. Like I know you say that it yes, it fluctuates to, depending on where we are in our life phase, you know, whether adolescents or older. But it's so interesting that we we are intuitively People don't realize they're doing it, that they are always trying to maintain that protein intake. So maybe you could explain, David, how does this then explain the obesity epidemic? What's happening? Well, <laughs> as we were saying earlier, if um, so, we have these the strong tendency to balance our diets, but um, we do that through having separate appetites for separate nutrients. But if we place in an imbalanced environment, those 
appetites come to compete. And um, we've shown in our experiments that for humans, protein is the strongest of those appetites. So our biology is no different than other species that are able to balance their diets. And in the right circumstances, we can do that as well. So the question is, what has changed? And what has changed is our food environment has changed. We've immersed ourselves in an imbalanced food environment where the protein content of our diets has been diluted particularly by um, uh, commercially available, heavily processed foods, um, which are for a number of reasons that we're beginning to understand, they're diluting protein relative to fats and carbohydrates. One of the reasons is that protein, is that that gives them a commercial competitive edge because protein is the more expensive of the macronutrients. The other is that the blend of macronutrients that tends to characterize these heavily processed foods, about sort of 5% to 7 to 10% of protein and midway in fat and carbohydrate for the rest of energy is, is maximally palatable. It's what's known as hyperpalatable. So that blend of nutrients makes those foods very tasty and again, gives them a commercial competitive advantage. The other thing is that fiber, which is a very important satiating factor um, in, um, in our diets is removed from those processed foods. So it's heavily commercially available, um, aggressively marketed processed foods that are diluting the protein content in our diet. And that's what's changed. And then we, we, we overeat fats and carbs to try to reach that our protein intake that we're that we're innately trying to get to, correct? Yep, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see it yourself very clearly. Um, when when you're short of protein, your protein appetite um, makes you start to crave savory flavors, you know, umami flavors, the flavors that are associated and have evolved. Um, this way to be associated with high protein foods. So you start to desire and crave those flavors. If you find that the nearest um, source of those flavors happens to be a bag of um, barbecue flavored potato chips, then they'll have all the right cues. They'll taste like protein, but they're just fat and carbs. So you've been fooled into eating a protein decoy and that's an example where your appetite for protein, which is trying to guide you to a balanced diet, is being distorted. It's being hacked by the food environment. Yeah, and you guys say something very interesting. You put, humans don't want to overeat protein. You ask the question, why should we be unwilling to overeat to the, ex to the extent that on a diet containing a high percentage of protein, you'll eat less food than you need to maintain your body weight. Yes, losing weight might be welcome for many of us today, but throughout our species existence, this has never been a desirable outcome. In fact, just the opposite. The challenge wasn't getting enough to eat in order to survive. A dietary regime that guaranteed weight loss would have been suicidal. And that's very, and you talk about, I can't remember what paper it was, but where the, there was like, you, they found some papers from like the 1800s of somebody that was eating rabbit and they just couldn't do it anymore because right. that's all they ate. Mm -hmm. And so I couldn't help but think when I read this, one of the biggest trends right now is a carnivore diet. Mm -hmm. And so we do have a mechanism that shuts that off. So what is your thoughts on that? Uh, um, Dave, do you want me to go on that one? Yeah, you, you, you go ahead, <laughs> Steve. Yeah, you start. But you're, you're exactly right, Karen. We're, we're evolutionary biologists. And if you see something, a very strong signal in biology, it makes you question why it's there. And the answer is usually because it makes adaptive sense. It's, it's survival involved. sense. It's a, it makes survival sense. That's right. And so it really is puzzling that, that um, we, like many animals, not only won't eat too little protein, so we regulate our intake up to the appropriate amount of protein, and that makes sense. You need protein to get the nitrogen that you need to build tissues, maintain tissues, reproduce. 
but we also don't overeat protein or uh, it's hard to get many animals including us to overeat protein to the extent that we will eat fewer calories if you make us try and do it so that begged the question well is there a problem with eating too much protein is there mm -hmm. is there a bad side to us and and clearly if you eat nothing but protein you end up with um, what's called rabbit fever and you will die and that's but that's a really really high protein diet but we're regulating to a lower level than that so the question uh, had to be answered with a more subtle um, answer than then you're going to die if you eat more than um, your your regulated intake so we started to explore that in, in experiments initially with fruit flies um, beloved of geneticists the world over um, and then in mice and then by looking at associations across human populations and in each case we found a similar signal and that is that if you force an animal onto a diet where it overconsumes protein, there are costs, particularly during um, midlife and early late life, when it seems that um, increasing protein intake beyond the optimum drives uh, a faster rate of aging. So the process of aging is driven um, particularly by protein. And if you have too much protein, you're supercharging the process of aging. Now, now those benefit the, the consequences uh, can be relatively subtle. Um, and the benefits of weight loss can outweigh them. So if you're balancing trying to lose um, unhealthy weight against the costs that accrue through having a higher protein ratio in your diet, then then that's a, a that that's a balance of risks, and and there are clearly cases where it's worth that balance, but it it is of concern, I think, if people are, are already a healthy weight, if they're trying to overconsume protein, um, then against your tendency to do it, your body's telling you not to do it, and hence you're eating fewer calories as a result. There there may well be costs that we don't well we wouldn't consider to be worth the, 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 the risk. Especially if a high protein diet is your habitual normal diet. It's different if it's a therapeutic diet that's applied in an emergency situation, basically, where there's, you know, health needs to lose weight, for example. But if it's your normal diet over prolonged periods, then certainly it's a risk that I would think isn't worth taking. Mm -hmm. And there was a, you guys, there was, um, I don't know who it, I think it was Walter Longo, but I'm not exactly sure, who put out all the research around kind of the calorie restriction um, and longevity. And it was interesting because you guys kind of dispelled that, didn't you? <laughs> that that's not what it was. That's not calorie restriction. Yeah, it, it's slightly more complex calorie restriction per se does have um, metabolic benefits um, and particularly it seems not due to the calories that's what we showed that it isn't the calories per se that matter but rather the the timing of ingestion of those calories so fasting intermittent fasting is what gives you the benefit of calorie restriction rather than eating fewer calories per se. Um, what we showed was that you could get equivalent benefits by adjusting the protein intake, um, particularly the ratio with respect to complex carbohydrates. So if you have a lower protein and a higher complex carbohydrate um, mixture, in the diet, then you could extend the lifespan in, in mice and um, particularly during that midlife, early late life period. And then as Volta showed, and as we showed too actually um, concurrently, um, when you get into your late life, then you need a higher requirement for protein. And that, that's because of a whole series of things that happen to you as you begin to age. Um, in particular, you become less efficient at using protein. You're more prone to break down lean tissue. Uh, it's harder to synthesize lean tissue. 
and your protein target goes up as a result of that. You've got to eat more to get sufficient to maintain your lean mass. And if you don't do that, you end up with problems, um, sarcopenia and other challenges in late life. Um, right. And also, as your protein target goes up, if you don't adjust your diet appropriately uh, and you stick on a lower protein, uh, let's say, processed food diet, then you're more prone to overeating and hence putting on weight during that phase of life. Mm -hmm. The reason you have to eat more fats and carbohydrates to reach the same intake of protein, and if that requirement's increasing, then it gears up the extent to which you overeat fats and carbohydrates. Yeah, I find it's, it's, it kind of doesn't make sense because when you look at it from an evolution or from a metabolic standpoint, let's say, when you're in your midlife, in your 40s, you know, if we're not supposed to eat as much protein, that means we're going to eat more carbs and fats, which means we're going to gain weight. And we all know that metabolic health has a lot to do with longevity. So right. it's like, right. it, it doesn't really that's make much sense. No, that's, that, that's what we call the protein paradox, actually. Mm -hmm. we've, we've resolved this recently. We had a big um, publication that came out um, just a couple of months ago that helps resolve this issue. You, you're exactly right. You, a lower protein, higher carbohydrate, um, intake is going to support better midlife metabolic health but it risks if the carbohydrates are the wrong sort of carbohydrates and the diet is high in its energy density that same combination would risk you becoming overweight obese and um, suffering those sorts of challenges which will shorten your lifespan mm -hmm. So what you need to do is get that lower protein, higher carbohydrate ratio comprising the right carbohydrates. They need to be carbohydrates that are um, hard to digest, sort of high, um, high fiber content in the diet, all the things that you would normally find in, in whole food um, diets. And you certainly don't find, as David explained earlier, in highly processed um, diets. So it's, mm -hmm. it's balancing those two things, minimizing protein intake during that period of your life, maximizing healthy carbohydrates without um, putting yourself at risk of overconsumption and obesity as a result of protein leverage. Interesting. So I do have a theory about this, but only for women. And I know yep. that you, you told me before we started that you just wrote a paper on the protein leverage hypothesis against perimenopausal women. Exactly. So I'm very interested to hear this, but I'll tell you my theory first, <laughs> which is, I always tell women that as they're going through perimenopause, they're losing and into menopause, they lose their estrogen. And estrogen is one of the most important hormones to our health, especially as women. We've got estrogen receptors on every organ in the body. It has uh, got 800 different functions. That was the last I read was 800 different functions in the system. And so we naturally put, are supposed to put fat on. We're supposed to gain some weight during this time so that we can get some estrogen because estrogen can be made from fat cells. And so I just wonder if there's something in there, because, you know, like you said, it's all about evolution and like survival of the species. So are we maybe supposed to eat a higher fat carb diet? So we actually put on a little bit of fat, maybe? Look, it is important to say that putting on a bit of fat, particularly towards the end of life, is protective. We know, we know that, um, particularly as you get older and as you become challenged by infectious diseases or whatever else, it can be, um, it can be protective. So it, it, it's not all about um, not putting on any fat. Our take on perimenopause is, is a little different. It sort of, it, it's, it relates to what you, you, you said just then, Karen. One thing that happens um, particularly in around perimenopause in women, but it happens to both sexes as we age, 
is that we become less efficient at handling protein. So as, as we get older, and it probably is adaptive to some degree, we, we become a little bit insulin resistant. We become yep. a little bit more hypertensive um, as, as we age. And these, these are likely sort of protective in, in older age. They're not good for you in mid age, but in, in middle age, but as you get older, they become protective. Um, and the thing is, as you start to um, become a little bit more insulin resistant, your protein breakdown goes up a little bit. Insulin normally stops your um, muscles breaking down their own protein. It also, so when, when we age and we become a little bit insulin resistant, we start to break down at a higher rate our lean tissue, uh, our muscles, our bones, um, and also to burn protein in our livers to produce glucose, which you don't really need to do, but you just start to do it as you get a, a little bit older, as you, as you age, that happens. Now that happens in men as well as in women, but around perimenopause, as exactly as you say, Karen, when estrogen levels drop and FSH levels go up, there's um, around that combination of hormonal events, there's an acceleration of protein breakdown, um, which is, we think, why women become more prone to osteoporosis and, and um, muscle loss during that period. And so what we're proposing is that this will, if you like, supercharge protein leverage. So your protein requirements are going up during that period is a result of, of these hormonally driven processes driving um, increased breakdown of protein, resistance to building new tissue, burning of um, um, uh, protein in the liver. And so unless you then shift your diet to a higher proportion of protein, and it need only be sort of a few percent um, increase, but that's sufficient. Unless you do that, protein leverage will cause you to overconsume calories to get to your higher protein target. And that will then set in train this um, vicious cycle, which drives you to ever uh, increasing your protein target as you become more and more metabolically dysregulated. And, and that can drive um, an obesity um, crisis in, the, in an individual or, or at a population level. So that's what we think might be happening. It's the it's this the changes naturally occurring changes around perimenopause uh, hormonal changes are, are just accelerating that increase in protein target, which interacts with our food environment to cause excessive um, weight gain. But it's really sense? important that that's specific to a processed food environment because. Yeah. It doesn't happen. You don't get an increase in obesity in hunter-gatherer hunter populations, for example, with perimenopause, um, because those populations are in a food environment that is comprised of complex carbohydrates and a lot of fiber and the sorts of um, uh, dietary patterns that our bodies evolved to age in. It's the shift to modernize processed food environments that pose the risk. Interesting. So, because I think of perimenopause in your forties, but your research was saying that it's, that that's the time when you should be not eating as much protein. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I, I guess in, in, in that case, we because right, our bodies are calling out for more of it. So we end up eating more, but we should be eating less protein during that time. Well, in, in the case it's all relative to your protein target. I think that's the key point. And if your protein target is going up, you need to follow it. Mm -hmm. And it, it would seem, and this, is, this, this has come to us really since we wrote the book, actually, that the perimenopause is a special case of, um, of, of this that, that is particularly um, a, a, an issue in women, obviously. And um, it may be a reason why slightly earlier than 
Uh, we were talking about 60, 65 being the age when your protein requirements would go up in both sexes, and I think that's, that, that's true. Um, there is a, an additional case where women become um, requiring of higher protein intakes during that period around perimenopause. Yeah, I definitely find that it's better for the weight part of things if women increase protein during this time and start, you know, lifting weights to balance that out. It helps with the weight more so than cardio or anything else. Exactly. And that would, that would be, that supports what we're saying exactly supports it. Mm -hmm. So increasing the protein, but not increasing the whole all of the macros is basically because you're saying like if you increase all of them trying to reach that protein leverage you're going to gain weight so you got to bring back the fat and carbs and uptick the protein for optimal so it's all about proportions and and what you're doing is increasing the proportion of protein and and this is this is the good news story i think um our appetites still work we still have our protein appetite and our other appetites they're there we haven't lost them what we've done is we've messed them up by putting them in this inappropriate food environment and if you put them in the right environment they'll work and so you don't need to count things you just need to um, manage your food environment so that you've got the proportions in your food in environment right and, and that's really simply achieved if you need a higher protein intake then and commensurately lower total energy intake, which is um, the other thing that will happen often around um, midlife and later life because you become less active, um, then the simplest way to do it is to take out extraneous fats and carbs and that will concentrate protein. It shifts the ratio. And then your appetites do the rest. You, you just eat until you feel uh, and, and, and until you feel full you don't need to worry about counting anything Stella didn't count anything no yeah nor did the blob, did the blob. <laughs> <laughs> and we also see in the wild that so Stella was feeding to a fixed target it was a relatively short-term um, study about 30 days feeding to a fixed target but we see in the wild with species primate species when their target moves their food selection follows so for example lactating macaque monkeys in the wild um, when they're lactating uh, they eat almost a third more um, in roughly the same balance as they do when they're not lactating but almost a third more calories overall um, golden monkeys in china um, during the cold in the winter, when they um, require more energy for keeping their bodies warm, they eat specifically almost a third more of fats and carbohydrates, but the same amount of protein. So they know instinctively how to track changes in their nutrient requirements. And we have that ability too, just that it operates only in an undestroyed food environment. Mm -hmm. I would love both of your opinions then on the ketogenic diet that's predominantly fat and the carnivore diet, which is predominantly protein. What do you think is going to happen? Like, what do you think is going on on the inside in those people? If we are just driven to have a certain amount of protein in our diet, what's happening when we're getting an excess in the carnivore? And then what's happening when we're getting this excess of fat in the diet? Uh, there, there's, there's probably three distinct points that we need to make here. One is a ketogenic diet is, uh, can be therapeutically mm -hmm. useful in certain circumstances. And the original um, ketogenic diet that, that was used therapeutically was in, in the context of um, trying to manage epilepsy in, in adolescence, and it's very effective in that sense. But that's a, very, that's a low protein ketogenic diet, which is really tough, which is the second point, I think, which is that compliance on these diets is, um, unless you're a special sort of person, they're not for the general populace. You know, we're talking about, at, at the moment, uh, a world where three two thirds of adults are, are classified as being overweight or obese in, in countries like Australia or the US. 
um, those diets are really effective means of losing weight, and we know why, and we've explained why. It's to do with your protein appetite. But they're just not able to be complied with by your average person. So that, that's the second thing. Um, the third thing is, if you really do force yourself and you've got the, um, the, 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 the type of character that allows your self to be you know forced onto a diet like that for a, an extended period then what you're doing is you're really starting to channel your metabolism to manage it um, and and the human metabolism like that of a cockroach is remarkably good at um, adapting itself physiologically to the most unlikely and broad range of different diets and you see that across you know, if you're an Inuit or somebody um, who's living on the African savanna, you've got a very different diet. And humans are good at this. You know, we're, we're an omnivore. We're the cockroach of the primate world. Um, but the, the downside is that, that if you stick on a fixed diet, you start to lose metabolic flexibility. You're, you're tuned to dealing with that set of circumstances. And that makes it hard for you to get off and be healthy on other dietary regimes. And when you think about it, our human metabolism has evolved to be highly adaptable, to be able to deal with seasonal changes in food abundance and food type, to, to deal with periods of fasting during the normal daily cycle and across the year, um, and to, to manage changing food environments um, providing they haven't changed as quickly as they have in recent times. Um, and, and if you stick on a particular uh, extreme diet, you, you risk losing that capability, it seems. Um, there is that risk. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the risk of, as we've said, there is a universal signature of increased rates of ageing um, and metabolic consequences that are not healthful ones uh, that accompany persistent uh, restriction to a higher protein, lower carbohydrate regime. Yeah. So there's a set of, a set of key points, I think, there. And um, the therapeutic argument is uh, it's a little bit like saying, you know, if you're suffering a heart attack, um, then it's, it's, kind of critical that, that you, you have um, a, a radical intervention, um, but you wouldn't use that radical intervention as part of your normal healthy heart program. Um, you yeah. know, yeah. defibrillator isn't necessary for part of your normal healthy heart lifestyle, but it's critical under those circumstances when you need an intervention to save your life. Mm -hmm. So that's how these extreme diets, I think, could be useful. But as a, as a chronic lifestyle, most of us couldn't stick to them. And nor would it likely be desirable that you did. Yeah, I totally it, agree. It's also true that if ketosis were generally a healthy state in humans, as opposed to a biohack for specific circumstances, like as Steve says, epilepsy, um, then you would find it widespread among human populations. And in fact, you don't find chronic ketosis in any human population other than ones that are on these diets. Even the traditional Inuit, they have specific mutations that keep them out of ketosis. Wow. And that from a biological point of view is very telling. It makes you ask, as we were saying, step back, look at the diversity and ask, well, why don't we find this more commonly if it's a... Um, a healthy state. And likewise yeah. in wild primates, you see them going to ketosis in specific emergency situations like prolonged periods of fruit shortage, but they come out of it again. Yeah, yeah. I say that often because I work with many women that have come out of years of being in ketosis or being on the carnivore diet and they're a mess when they get to me and, you know, it shuts down their reproduction. It just it wreaks so much havoc on their system long term and not everybody. I know people that have done it for five plus years that have had no complications. But 
with everything that you guys have discovered and all of your research, it just says very loud and clear that when it is left to the intuition, not some book on some new fat diet, we automatically and intuitively eat you know, 15% to 20% protein, and then a balance of carbs and fats in there as well. So it's this balanced diet. And you even prove that protein intake also equals reproduction. And when the higher the protein, the better reproduction there was in all of the animal species that you were researching. So that says something too obviously, right? That we're meant to have some protein in our diet, not this super high fat diet. Um, like you said, uh, David, I completely agree with, which is ketosis was a state of survival. We have it as a backup source of fuel for in times of famine. It was not our preferred source of fuel, which many people say, you know, all the keto zealots will say it was our preferred source of fuel. This is what we're naturally supposed to be. And it's like, no, maybe when we were starving in the winter and all there was, was maybe some meat to eat or something like that. We're going for days without eating. But in general, no, it's not the preferred source of fuel for the human body. And I just, I just think that you guys have really proven that with all your research. There's, there's a lot of um, misinterpretation, particularly of the ancestral human diet um, in yes. the fat literature. And we've, we've got some um, really outstanding colleagues at the University College London who, who really have done some of the best work in tracing the human diet ancestrally. And David, in his recent trips to um, the, the Congo Basin, for example, looking at some of the, the hunter-gatherer populations there too, the notion that we um, were hyper-carnivores who had low-carbohydrate diets is just wrong. It's just flat out wrong. And so what have they found that would, what would, what was the diet of million before agriculture? What are they finding? What was the diet? Well, it, 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 the one common thing, of course, about the diet was that it was a diet of natural and real foods. And what that means is complex carbohydrates, um, uh, low proportions of saturated fats because most um, wild animals uh, don't have high proportions of fat mm -hmm. and the proportion of saturates within those is lower than agricultural animals. Um, a wide, relatively wide um, range of macronutrient proportions, um, but as I said, the macronutrient quality was consistent, and that is from real foods, and also um, a high proportion of fiber. So the um, Congo hunter-gatherers that I was with at the end of 2019, um, and we haven't yet measured exactly what the macronutrient proportions were, but I can tell you it was not high uh, protein and it was relatively high carbohydrates and also fats, but from complex sources, from real foods. And I think this is representative of hunter-gatherers um, in general. It actually takes us right back to our beginnings because uh, as scientists, because um, humans have eaten a lot of insects over the, <laughs> over the years as well. So insects have been an important part of the diet of humans. Very, very nutritious. <laughs> and one reason that the protein content of hunter-gatherer diets has been overestimated is a bias in the fossil record. It's much easier to find bones around a hearth and evidence of meat eating around a hearth than it is um, a fragments, plant fragments, for example. So historically, this has biased the perception and interpretation of what the uh, human ancestors were, um, were eating in the Paleolithic. Yeah, I would have I would think that there yet would have been a lot of lean meat, insects, or like birds, like gro gross or whatever, like, you know, pheasants, things like that, like things that were easy to catch, fish, lots of fish, because we would have been good fishermen, I think. They've, there is evidence that we lived a lot near lakes and rivers and things like that. And the greens part, I, I do question because leafy greens did not taste like our leafy greens. <laughs> a million years ago. Leafy greens were horribly bitter. 
They wouldn't have filled up a person. They would have only been eaten, I think, in times of desperation when there was no meat and no fruit. Not entirely true. Um, As I say, in the Congo Basin, there are a lot of leafy greens in the diet that are undomesticated. They're wild. Everything these people eat is is gathered or hunted. Um, And it's a fair proportion of leafy greens. A lot of the starches come from tubers. Um, Of course, that's different. Um, Fats from palm oil, for example. And as you say, a wide variety of of animal-derived proteins as well but not a very large proportion in the diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's record too to show that most hunter-gatherer tribes, I think if not all of them, had some form of animal protein in their diet, correct? I would say yes, Mm -hmm. yes. I'm just thinking of um, Western Price when he went Mm. around, yeah, in his work where he said that he went to some of the last remaining tribes and he said one thing they all had in common was they all ate animal protein. Mm. But you know, that's also true of of other species of primates is that virtually all of them include to some extent animal derived foods within their diets. So maybe a very small proportion, chimpanzees eat termites, for example. Um, Most primates will eat uh, insects um, and some of them regularly like chimpanzees eat um, mammal derived meat as well. Wow you guys have lived a very interesting life both of you. you you've done well with life that's what I have to say. <laughs> you've just all the things that you've experienced and the places you've gone and I'm a big traveler myself so reading your stories in your book was great. It reminded me of all these crazy things and circumstances that I myself have been in and weird places and tribal communities and in the middle of nowhere, (laughs) eating their food and seeing how they live. And it's great. So for all those that are listening, it's Eat Like the Animals. You can find it on Amazon and anywhere else. It is such a good read. So please pick it up because we've really scratched the surface on what's in this book. And it's an entertaining read. So one of you's funny, Stephen. That's you, isn't it? You're funny. I you're both funny. You're both funny. <laughs> Somebody's funny in there because I cracked up laughing quite a few times in there. I'm like, well, one of these guys is being really funny. <laughs> well, it's both of us. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> and we've had a lot of fun together, Karen, over the last uh, approaching forty years. Wow. Um, yeah, we've grown old together, and actually the biggest adventure in some ways has been the last decade where we've set up this amazing place called the Charles Perkins Centre at the University of Sydney. Wow. Um, bringing, bringing disciplines together from philosophers and historians to, to medics and mathematicians and biologists and everybody you need to really start reweaving the the, the, not only the food system, but the whole of society, really. You need, these are big problems that we're facing, and uh, we need to really understand the lessons we can learn from our biology mm-hmm. and how we can rebuild the world to support um, healthy outcomes and equitable outcomes, and that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, we really need to reverse to progress, don't we? Regress to progress. <laughs> what I was looking for but yeah that's it's we need to go back to the way it was not it's sad there's a lot of sadness to the book as well because you guys really point out what's happening to our world and what's happening to our food system and even in the last of the hunter-gatherer tribes in not Budapest what is it Bhutan Bhutan thank you David Bhutan and how you know you see these people that are living up in the mountains in, in this in beautiful environment, this hunter-gatherer type environment, and yet they're shipping in processed foods. And it's like, no. <laughs> yeah, devastating. So what snacks for you two? Any, any big plans? I know you're in lockdown because of COVID, but once that's lifted, or, or do we have a next adventure? Um. Mine is, of course, COVID dependent, but it will be back to the Congo, um, this yeah. time not looking at hunter gatherers, but gorillas, that lowland gorillas that live in similar environment to those um, hunter gatherers. 
We've studied mountain gorillas in um, Uganda, but they're uh, very different ecologically. They're a different subspecies. Um, and now we want to understand how lowland gorillas that live in similar habitats to human hunter-gatherers um, compare with them in the broader scope of primates. Wow. Stephen, what about you? Oh, look, I think the um, there's a whole load of things happening um, all the way from really extraordinary um, experimental work through to all the bigger things that we're trying to do together through the Charles Perkins Centre. So um, I think what we're trying to do now is translate what we've discovered and really use it to best effect to change food systems, to change the way that, that we live in our modern world. Not, not going back um, to the past, but actually taking, taking the good stories. And it, it is a story of hope because as we say, we have this exquisite biology, which still works. Uh, we haven't lost that. If we'd lost our biology, then that would be a problem, but, but it's still there. We just need to put it in the right environment. And that's, that's something that's within all of our grasps. Mm -hmm. And it, I, yeah. It is one of the big projects at the moment that we have is taking an ecological approach that we've developed through our careers with other species and applying it to understand the kind of dynamics that have led to the changes in our food environments and what kind of um, approaches can be implemented to managing them for better outcomes. And for that, we need to take a complex systems approach to understanding human food environments and the ways that they've evolved and the ways that we can manage that evolution for better um, outcomes. Because if you think of it, we're an immensely privileged species. We have the science, we have the technology, we have the ethics basically to create whatever environment we wish to create. And yet we've created the one food environment that backfires so radically on our health globally and also on the environment. It's usually our food environment, our, our food systems are hugely destructive of the environment. We need to understand how to manage that like we need to understand how to manage natural ecologies. Mm -hmm. So will there be a second book then? We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Eat like the animals part two, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and I will look forward to part two and interviewing you again. <laughs> thank you, Karen. Real pleasure.